Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Joe Borelli. I'm Chair of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management, and I am joined by my colleagues, Council Member Maisel, who is the only person who decided to join me on this lovely day thus far. The Committee on Fire and Emergency Management primarily oversees the New York City Fire Department and the city's emergency medical services, which are principally responsible for firefighting as well as maintaining first responder medical service. The committee also oversees the Office of Emergency Management, which is responsible for coordinating the New York City's emergency planning and response for all types and scales of emergencies, including coastal storms. Regarding the subject of today's oversight hearings, we are here to discuss the city's emergency planning for coastal storms. Both the FDNY and OEM play a critical role in leading the city's response to natural disasters, such as tropical storms and coastal floods. During large-scale emergencies, the city employs a citywide incident management system, or SIMS, which guides interagency coordination and streamlines the process for delivering vital services to New Yorkers in need of assistance. Additionally, OEM is responsible for development and coordination of the city's coastal storm plan, CSP, which provides detailed planning for the potential evacuation, sheltering, and other steps necessary to prepare for potential flooding that results from coastal storms. In doing so, OEM works in consultation with the National Weather Service to ensure that information is disseminated to the public and people are advised accordingly and uh, ensure safety during coast storms. As we all know, our city experienced the devastating effects of Superstorm Sandy in 2012. During the city's recovery and rebuilding efforts from the deadly storms, we learned how to better collectively prepare for natural disasters of that magnitude, which include how to best address the storm surge and coastal flooding. Today, the committee will examine several areas, including OEM's plan for coastal storms and hurricane, how the city communicates with the public prior to, during, and after major coastal storms, the FDNY's preparation and response capabilities during a coastal storm, and during evacuation protocols set forth by OEM during large-scale incidents. We look forward to hearing the testimony from the administration about these vital efforts and examine the detailed planning that is taken to ensure that all New Yorkers remain safe in the times of coastal flood emergencies. Additionally, we are also hearing a completely unrelated but important piece of legislation at today's hearing, especially if you enjoy smoking cigars in your backyard. Proposed intro 13-A, sponsored by myself and Councilmember Brannon, aims to remove the current restrictions on the use of residential fire pits. These commercially uh, sold products, sold at hardware stores throughout New York City, will be enjoyed by countless New Yorkers this summer for making backyard s'mores or adding to the ambiance of an evening barbecue. However, local restrictions make such operation prohibited despite the many safety features that are currently included in all commercial models to minimize the risk proposed by an open fire. I look forward to hearing testimony from the fire department uh, regarding how we can ensure that people are able to safely and legally enjoy fire pits in their backyard, along with cocktails and cigars. I now would like to ask those members of the administration who plan to testify to please state your name for the record and to raise your right hands as the committee council administers the oath. I'm Joe Esposito, Commissioner of New York City Emergency Management. Anthony. Thanks, Joe. Anthony DeVita, Assistant Chief of Operations, Fire Department. Fred Villani, Assistant Chief of EMS, Fire Department. Meg Prebram, Assistant Commissioner of Planning and Preparedness, OEM. Christina Farrell, Deputy Commissioner of External Affairs. Thank you. Uh, do you firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. We'll start with the commissioner, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Borelli and members of the committee. I'm Joe Esposito, the Commissioner of New York City Department of Emergency Management, and I'm here and I'm pleased to provide information on the work that the city has done to plan for coastal storms. Let me begin by discussing how the agency coordinates planning efforts. As we all know, every emergency can create new and, un and unforeseen uh, conditions. Emergency management is responsible for the development maintenance and oversight of over 40 emergency plans for a range of natural and man-made hazards with a focus on citywide coordination and cooperation and operations. These plans include coordinated roles and responsibilities of key stakeholders for these events, primarily city agencies. Plans may also include citywide objectives for managing the incident, logistical resource needs and operations, templates for emergency agency, uh, for interagency coordination and data management, and checklists for key tasks and actions. Plans are either operational specific, such as debris management, or hazard specific, such as the New York City Coastal Storm Plan. 
Coastal storms, including nor'easters and hurricanes, are not merely weather events. They are highly destructive forces of nature that bring multiple hazards, including violent winds, tornadoes, powerful waves, torrential rains, and dangerous storm surge. The city's coastal storm plan is made up of eight scalable standalone plans. It includes storm tracking, evacuation and sheltering, communications and public information, logistical operations, commodities distribution, debris management, and recovery and restoration. Every city agency and many state and federal agencies, including the military, are involved in all aspects of the Coastal Storm Plan, drafting and updating them, training on and exercising them, and of course, activating them when necessary. New York City continuously monitors weather in consultation with the National Weather Service, and we rely on these predictions to make important decisions. These decisions can be costly and have potential to affect many New Yorkers none more so than the decision for the mayor to issue a mandatory evacuation order. Zones must be evacuated well before the storm arrives, and we have timetables set up for that. Before Hurricane Sandy, the city had three hurricane evacuation zones. In 2013, the city revised and expanded its hurricane evacuation zones to divide the city into six uh, numbered zones based on the risk of storm surge flooding. Each zone has less residents and it's compared to the previous system, which provides decision makers greater flexibility in determining the proper extent of an evacuation order. <laughs> Roughly three million New Yorkers are living within the city's hurricane evacuation zones. While we recommend that people who need to evacuate try to stay with family or friends, the city will open safe, secure, and supplied shelters throughout the five boroughs, staffed by city employees and many, many volunteers. Individuals with special medical needs may not require hospitalization or nursing home care, but may need more care than can be provided at a hurricane shelter. For people unable to, uh, yeah, for people who, who require this additional level of care, the city will also open up special medical needs shelters. Those unable to evacuate on their own can call 311 to get assistance evacuating to a city shelter. To provide information for those with disabilities, access, and functional needs, the advanced warning system will be used. This system is a robust tool that provides real-time incident-specific information throughout, through service providers with pre-established trusted relationships. Over 1,800 service providers representing hundreds of thousands of clients transmit information to, these, to their clients that is revised and customized for their specific needs empowering them to act in a way that is most appropriate for them. This timely, targeted, and specific evacuation information includes details about evacuation assistance. <clears throat> the emergency supply stockpile consists of more than 6,000 pallets of material and supplies, all shelters, as well as commodity distribution points. <clears throat> it consists of durable and over-the-counter medical supplies, personal care items, cots, blankets, food, water, baby and pet supplies, pet supplies. It is designed to support the basic needs of 70,000 people who are sheltered up to seven days. Supplies are ready for deployment in 48 hours to shelters and distributing points throughout the city. Public information and outreach is key. After Hurricane Sandy, New York City Emergency Management launched the Know Your Zone campaign, which encourages New Yorkers to find out if they live in one of the city's hurricane evacuation zones the hazards that they may face, and the steps to take to be prepared. We expanded our outreach efforts on residents in hurricane evacuation zones, providing hundreds of presentations annually in hurricane evacuation zones and mailing, mailing hurricane guides to New York City residents and businesses in all the city's hurricane evacuation zones. We also have run ads and created videos that are currently running and will run throughout the coastal storm season. Through innovative partnerships with the city's public, private, and nonprofit sectors, successful programs like CERT, direct community and elected official engagement, and extensive use of news media, our outreach efforts have reached millions of people. Notify New York City, the city's free emergency notification system, has grown significantly since Hurricane Sandy and now boasts more than 734,000 subscribers and has expanded to offer common uh, notifications in 13 languages, American Sign Language, and audio formats. 
we launched a new mobile application this year that has seen more than 68,000 downloads. In the aftermath of Sandy, the city set up services to support residents throughout the five boroughs and outlined needs to support community recovery and resilience throughout several initiatives, such as the, Sh the Share Your Space program, which identifies spaces in communities that can be potentially support the city's emergency recovery operations or be used for community outreach events. We have the Community Emergency Planning in New York City Toolkit, an interactive workbook designed to guide communities through developing their own emergency plans. Not only does it provide the hazards these communities may face, such as hurricanes or utility disruptions, it also outlines the key responsible role com uh, communities can play to protect their residents and organizations. We have the High Watermark Initiative, a program that, inc that increases local communities' awareness of flood risks. High watermark signs are posted throughout the five boroughs, noting the level of storm surge in these locations that occurred during Hurricane Sandy. All of this planning requires testing to make sure it is operational, usable, and ready to go. We have a robust training and exercise program to build the capacity to implement the plan. We have we provide a variety of training courses, both online and classroom training. More than 20,000 people have taken our hurricane shelter training, which targets the role of the city employees play in supporting our, our sheltering operations. Participants in these training courses range from city employees to private sector and nonprofit partners. Our community emergency response team are certain uh, volunteers. New York City Emergency Management hosts annual exercises aimed at preparing New York City personnel in supporting coastal storm operations. These exercises, including city hall executives and agency commissioners with the goal of rehearsing critical decision-making uh, during a coastal storm. Previous exercises have focused on evacuations, shelter, and school closure decision-making. Our coastal storm plan is vast and incredibly comprehensive. This is just a very small snapshot of the massive planning, testing, and training we have done to prepare the city for the coastal storms. We are happy to come to any of the city uh, council districts in, uh, in, in the city to discuss the specifics of uh, their coastal storm preparation in that area. And my team does this on a regular basis. We will continue to build our hurricane preparedness and to bring to bear the best thinking and resources to the benefit of New York City. City Council has been a great partner to us in encouraging people to sign up for Notify NYC ensuring their constituents know their zones and assisting us in passing on timely and important information during emergencies. Thank you for joining us in our mission to support the preparedness of New Yorkers and thank you for your time here today and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Does anyone else have a statement? Oh, sorry. Good afternoon, Chair Borelli and all the council members present. Uh, my name is Anthony DeVita, and I'm Assistant Chief of uh, Operations at the New York City Fire Department. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the Fire Department's emergency planning for coastal storms. In addition to our partners at New York City Emergency Management, I am joined this morning by uh, Assistant Chief Fred Villani of uh, EMS Operations. Uh, the Fire Department puts a great deal of thought into planning for coastal storms and hurricanes. Hurricanes and severe storms can significantly disrupt normal fire operations. Such storms may be accompanied by flooding, damaging winds, and storm surge. Depending on the size, strength, and track of the storm, large coastal and inland areas of the city can flood, which means that fire department units in those areas will be faced with increased call volume, civilian evacuation, restricted uh, access to response areas, and the possible evacuation of FDNY uh, quarters. We plan, conduct, we plan, conduct drills, and establish protocols to ensure that department can effectively prepare for and react uh, and be proactive uh, as the hurricane is uh, uh, predicted to impact New York City. We also anticipate the ways in which a storm will impact our response to emergencies. Roads may become blocked by flooding or trees and debris. Apparatus may be neg negatively affected, including punctured tires, engine failure, electrical issues and adverse effects of, and the adverse effects of salt water. We may even face the effects of civil unrest or opportunistic terrorism. In order to meet these challenges, the department engages in intense planning at every level for operating during a major coastal storm. 
Senior leadership takes steps to increase staffing and activate additional resources, including working with our partners at New York City Emergency Management. In addition, firefighter transport teams are activated to support the homebound evacuation program. We also ensure that adequate procedures are in place to secure sufficient fuel for apparatus and emergency generators. We coordinate with fe fellow city agencies at the appropriate level of command to determine resources available during the storm. This may include, for example, coordinating with the NYPD regarding street closures and traffic diversion, coordinating with the Department of Parks and Recreation regarding tree removal, and conducting, uh, coordinating with the New York uh, National Guard and the United States Coast Guard, uh, to name but a few. FDMY divisions, battalions, and units compile lists of streets that are subject to flooding and could become impassable. Surveys are made to identify high ground locations within the affected areas where apparatus can be staged before the area becomes isolated. They also survey locations and conditions of institutional occupancies, such as hospitals, nursing homes, and correctional facilities. Where necessary, pre-planned procedures for these locations are developed and evaluated during training and drills. Units also maintain a list of hydrants located in their administrative area that are prone to become submerged during a storm. We've taken measures to protect our facilities that are most vulnerable to flooding, including uh, installing flood barriers, and uh, currently have mitigation projects uh, underway at a number of such facilities that will involve raising electrical and communication equipment above flooding levels and installing generators on elevated platforms. Uh, EMS has the ability to employ EMS station relocation trailers, which allow the department to relocate the essential components of an EMS station. Units also take steps to cover and protect exposed equipment and ensure that reserve apparatus are uh, properly equipped and serviceable. FDNY facilities prepare for severe weather using checklists of supplies and equipment that is procured in advance of the start of the hurricane season. Members ensure department uh, property is stored to minimize the risk of water damage and appropriate uh, warnings are posted in areas uh, that become hazardous if flooded, such as near electrical panels and appliances. A determination is made as to whether fuel tanks should be in quarters should be drained if, if expected to be uh, uh, affected by the flood water. Companies in areas prone to flooding plan for the potential to be relocated to host companies and ensure that appropriate preparations are made to accommodate them. Using assessments of the storm and weather forecasts, uh, senior operations leadership will determine the need for increased staffing and alternate scheduling. The Bureau of EMS may institute longer tours and the Bureau of Oper Fire Operations may allow flexible staffing to increase personal, uh, personnel availability. We have the ability to increase staffing at both uh, PSAC 1 and PSAC 2, our communications uh, centers, to handle greater call volume. A storm may also impact the type of equipment that the department uses during operations. Our rescue squads and cold water rescue units are equipped with life preservers and cold water rescue suits. The department will use high axle vehicles to transport uh, personnel and equipment to areas that have been flooded. And these high axle vehicles will be used to conduct uh, evacuations and rescue and patient, patient extraction in places that become difficult to access. access. Special operations personnel may deploy marine resources uh, such as uh, waders, rafts, and a variety of boats. We've also secured federal grant money to enhance our capabilities and resilience to major storms. We've trained and equipped a number of specialized teams to rescue victims in flooded areas, including 10 swift water teams, scuba teams, and urban search and rescue teams. We've purchased Zodiac boats, flood rescue boats, high angle uh, high axle vehicles and dewatering equipment. Uh, we continue holding ongoing training and drills to practice responding to a, uh, during a major storm, covering flood rescue ops and incident management. FDMY also mobilizes its incident management team for managing department operations pre and post storm and supporting the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene with this post-emergency uh, canvassing operation uh, no, not known as a PICO. 
During the storm, the storm itself, unit deployment is adjusted on an evolving basis to ensure that all, all the department is able to perform at the highest levels possible. All requests for information, directives, and orders are channeled through department leadership at the Fire Department Operations Center, the borough command level, and, in the, uh, and to field units. Reports on weather conditions and other pertinent information are transmitted via the Fire Department Operations Center to the Bureau of Communications and uh, as necessary to the units on the ground. Uh, department mobile command centers may be deployed to areas of the city that may have become isolated. Throughout the storm, the department remains in close contact with various agencies for continuing reports on weather and ground conditions. Senior leadership will also develop messages for transmission to public media by the Fire Department's Office of Public Information, OPI. OPI conveys safety messages and updates to various news media and radio stations. During extreme weather, OPI will work with local media to seek assistance reaching viewers, readers, and listeners with critical messages such as shutting off utilities or evacuating an area. The department may also request that media outlets transmit news for emergency personnel such as notifying off-duty personnel of an imminent recall. OPI uses its significant social media reach for these tasks as well. Field units are responsible for being aware of the flooding conditions in their response areas, and they make surveys to determine developing conditions, including the status of main arteries that have become impassable, uh, response areas that are flooded, location of downed trees, fallen live wires, and, submer and submerged vehicles, and whether relocation of the unit may become necessary. These developments are transmitted up the chain of command so that storm-specific procedures can be developed and adjusted as necessary. FDNY also plays a key ro role in preparation for the evacuation of medical facilities. In advance of evacuation orders, FDNY members survey medical facilities to touch base with facility incident managers, review evacuation procedures, and gather information to forward to OEM and State Department of Health. FDNY also manages the transportation section of the Healthcare Facility Evacuation Center. We know that the dynamics of hurricanes have nearly limitless variables. No two storms are alike, and variations in the size, speed, track, and location of the storms can lead to vastly different operating conditions and outcomes. Accordingly, FDNY members are highly skilled at adapting to evolving events. Especially during hurricanes, flexibility is emphasized at all command levels. Members are passionate about protecting the life and property of New Yorkers, and they will not let, a storm, let the storm conditions deter them from fulfilling that mission. And that concludes my section on the uh, storm uh, preparedness. I'm just going to read, uh, uh, discuss introduction 13. Okay. Uh, Introduction 13, uh, this bill would allow outdoor residential fire pits consisting of a freestanding vessel that is not designed for cooking in which a contained outdoor fire is made from gas burners or from burning wood. We have concern, concerns about this bill, but we would like to continue discussing the idea with the council. Backyard wood burning fire pits generate cinders in close proximity to combustible homes and vegetation and in particular, we are concerned about the enhanced potential for structural or brush fires. There are some safety mechanisms that could help mitigate these risks, but enforcement of those measures presents a challenge. As drafted, this bill would create an exception in the emission standard subchapter of Title 24 of the Administrative Code, which covers environmental protection and utilities. If we are able to find a solution, we believe that the legislation should also address Title 29, the New York City Fire Code, and that the fire department should be able that the fire department should be able to issue rules to guide the exemption, including, for example, to require that vessels be made of appropriate fireproof material, and that it must contain a spark guard or uh, and or screen. We look forward to further discussions on this topic, and we would be happy to take your questions at this time. Thank you very much, Chief. I just want to point out we're joined by Council Member Brannon, who is uh, very excited to be here, and uh, he's having a lovely day. Uh, so we'll, we'll skip, we'll save uh, 13A for a few minutes, but if we could start on some of the storm management things. 
Um, Thank you. I, I guess the first question is a, is a bit Staten Island specific since we have uh, multiple projects involving seawalls and storm surge protection, uh, both in, in Tottenville uh, and along the east shore where this, a seawall will eventually be constructed. When those systems are in place, will that require OEM to alter the, the, the plan for storm surges and flooding in that area? Well, th that'll depend on if we redo the uh, flood zones. You know, we rely on FEMA to, to, to uh, come up with the flood zones, and then we design our evacuation zones based on that, inf somewhat on that information. Uh, but, you know, ORR is doing uh, a lot of uh, resilience and, and protecting of the flood zones. We're also doing uh, temporary, uh, emergency management is overseeing some temporary measures where you might have seen some uh, sandbags we're putting in and tiger dams. But uh, depending on that, uh, it, may, it may need to adjust some of the zones. Um, can, can you explain, Commissioner, your interaction with hospitals and nursing homes uh, and adult care facilities and how they factor into the plan and, and what proactive steps the agency takes? Sure. I, I, if an event were to happen, we, we open up our uh, health care evacuation center, and the chief uh, mentioned that in his statement. Uh, that would be run out of the... Uh, uh, my, my, my shop, emergency operate, uh, EO, my EOC, emergency operations center in, in, my, in my building. And in there you have Greater New York, you have the Department of Health, you have the state, all the agencies, Veterans Affairs are there, and, and we would deal with the, with the facilities if they needed assistance. They have plans. Uh, they're overseen by the state. The state actually enforces and looks at their plans to make sure they have plans. But we deal with the state on a regular basis, and all of that would be coordinated out of the, uh, the HEC, with the health, health Care Evacuation Center. They have plans. They would put them in place. We would address any needs uh, that, they, that they had during, the, during that critical time. And again, that would be hours before. Uh, uh, you know, we have certain time frame for when you have to evacuate. 48 hours for the general public, 72 hours for facilities. So this would be in place well before the, stem, the storm came, uh, before the storm hit, 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 uh, hit the ground. And uh, uh, Chief DeVita, th this is a question that came up uh, during a hearing uh, a couple of months ago about uh, the homebound evacuation program. H how are people identified for that? And, and how does the agency, uh, I, I guess just a little bit more details on, on the homebound evacuation program, how that integrates with both storm management and just in general response to other incidents? Uh, Chair Burley, if I may defer to uh, Chief Villani mm -hmm. for, uh, for that response. So the city's homebound evacuation program addresses the need of evacuation for those people that are unable to evacuate on their own or without the assistance of family, friends, contractors, health care providers. These are people who would un be unable to evacuate from an evacuation zone if we didn't offer that assistance. They self-identify by uh, dialing 311 and ask for evacuation assistance. They are uh, asked a series of uh, predetermined questions uh, by the operator 311 that helps identify their, their level of mobilization. If someone is able to ambulate to the curb on their own, then a ride through accessorize is arranged for them to an evacuation shelter. If a person is identified as not being able to ambulate to the curb for one reason or another, but they can not sit unassisted, usually somebody who uh, uh, utilizes a wheelchair, then we arrange for a pickup with a firefighter transport team uh, to take them, their durable medical equipment, caregiver to an evacuation center. Those people who uh, are unable to ambulate to the curb, are unable to sit unassisted and essentially bedridden, uh, the call is switched to 911 where an ambulance is dispatched to pick them up and take them to a hospital that is outside of the flood zone. And uh, how many people have signed up through 311? I, I guess the, the first part of the question would be, does 311 take these requests just in posterity, uh, you, you know, at all times leading up to a storm or, or an incident, or is this just something that you anticipate happening before an incident? This, has happen this happens immediately before the incident. There is no uh, storage or, or taking of information ahead of time. The information would be stale. It might not be accurate at the time. And at the time of the storm, someone needs to determine whether they need assistance or, or they don't require the assistance. So at the time an evacuation order is issued or just before a time an evacuation order is, is issued is when a person would self-identify by calling 311. Their information would be taken at that time, distributed as necessary. So there, there is a concern then that if, if, if the department was to keep a record of this, that 
you know, two years down the road, they'd be sending some sort of a unit to a location and the person might be moved or deceased or whatever the case may be? Absolutely. The, the information would, would uh, in all likelihood not be accurate. And then uh, the, fi the final question I have on this, and then I'm going to turn to uh, intro 13. Has FDNY ever exercised its ability to expand the, the staffing level at PSAC before a storm? Yes. I mean, the short answer is yes. But yes. Like no, exactly. Yeah, yes, we have, uh, we have um, you know, obviously both PSAC 1 and 2 up and running, currently up and running, and we do, uh, we do have the ability and will uh, increase staffing at PSAC 1 and 2 in the event of a, uh, a coastal storm emergency. Councilman, just going back to the vulnerable population, you know, it would be very difficult to get one big list of vulnerable, but we deal with a lot of agencies, private and public, that maintain lists, the DOH, a lot of these service providers, and we would call that into play and, and run those lists to try and uh, uh, reach all of the people vulnerable. But again, as, as the FD said, uh, we'll be doing what he called a PICO, which is a post-evacuation camp. We're going to knock on every door in those zones that were evacuated. So we think that's, that's maybe a, a bit of a better st strategy. And, and how long would it take to mobilize a, a, a force to, to, to perform that function? We would go in there as soon as it's safe. You have to, after, after a storm, uh, you've got to get building department in there. Uh, FD would go in and see that these buildings are secured once or safe to enter. Once that is determined, they would be able to go in. It's usually uh, 24 to 48 hours would be knocking on those doors. Okay. And then just on uh, intro 13. Did I lose my list? Did I lose my list? Oh, no. Um, can you tell me, Chief, how often uh, FDNY or, or 311 receives complaints over fire pits? Is that something that is even tracked? Chair Pirelli, the um, intro 13 has uh, in the last, um, and recently I've become aware that this is um, a b a being proposed. And I haven't run st uh, statistics or run any numbers on uh, how many of our reports of smoke in the area or uh, structural fires or um, anything that related to an outdoor fire would uh, be ha have been related to a um, an outdoor fire pit so I could uh, I could get back to you with uh, any any uh, statistics that do lead lead us to uh, uh, five lead to fire pits being the, the cause of any uh, just in, in your rec in, in your recollection just over your career do, do you know of FDNY units giving violations for fire pits None that I know of. Um, I mean, I mean, are you, so good news is uh, what you mentioned about the emissions. Uh, I think we've addressed in an A version of the bill already. Um, I, I guess just I'd like you to <coughs> say, just on record, um, just how nice it is to sit by a fire and enjoy a, a cigar and a drink sometimes. <laughs> well, yes, I. I don't live in the city. I do. Uh, I do have a fire pit, as a matter of fact, and all those things you say are true. Yes. Uh, so, yes, of course, and uh, agreed. But there, are of, of course, concerns of um, you know the embers and just just as as we stated, and uh, but again, we're open to a conversation to to make sure that these um, call them structures or uh, pits are. Uh, safe and um, you know for the surrounding buildings and for the people that are using them. Uh, uh, just just one one last question on it, but uh, a serious one. Uh, and I know this out of experience because I've seen it, it happen. Um, do, do you know of units that have responded to to false alarms from neighbors that have smelled f smoke from these type of devices? Uh, again, n none, none that I'm aware of. Uh, also, let me add, uh, is, as far as accessing these uh, backyard fire pits, um, since we don't have access to uh, the backyards, uh, generally speaking, we um, you know, don't really have any data on, on or are able to enforce any kind of um, you know, rules or regulations based, just based on access to those private areas. 
But can, can we both agree that this might be something, though, that is uh, good for certain density zones in the city, but probably isn't good for all density and zoning? Uh, it's again, we're, again, we're open to open to discussion on on the matter, and um, again, with with safeguards in place, uh, everything could be is on is on the table for discussion. I'm going to pass it over to uh, Council Member Mazel because he was here before you. He's, he's on he's on time. Uh, so I have seniority. Uh, this doesn't necessarily directly relate to uh, your testimony, but I was curious about: Are there any operating fireboxes in the city at this time? The uh, alarm boxes on the street corners. Yeah. Yes. Th yes. There are some that are uh, th operational. Uh, I don't have the exact number, but thousands. There's thousands that are working, currently working. And uh, if, as, as far as we're concerned, every one of them that is is visible to the general public is in service as we speak. All right, because in my district, we have quite a number that are um, basically they're uh, decrepit and falling apart. And some of them don't have the, uh, the guts inside. Right, well, they're, right. Those. They have been removed. So people have been complaining about uh, uh, these because they've become eyesores. Okay. If, if you'd like to get uh, supply me with a list of those, uh, we could look into uh, whether they're in the process of being repaired or in the process of being dismantled for uh, or processes okay, thank being you. removed. And then uh, next is uh, Councilmember Brannon, who joins me as a co-sponsor of this bill. Pumped up. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, Commissioner, I had a question about um, OEM's preparation, how you collaborate for coastal storms. Like, if, I, if I'm figuring out if I want to go to the beach this weekend, I'll just look at the weather on Friday night or something. How soon, without giving up your special sauce, but how soon or how often are you tracking storms so that you are prepared, like before you notify the public, how soon before that are you guys already, you know, ramping up to, to have everything ready that you need to have ready? We speak National Weather Service at least twice a day. Uh, and that's every day of the year, and not just during storm season. And we get an update because weather is weather. It could be, it doesn't have to be a hurricane, it could be a snowstorm, a wind event, it could be anything. So we talk to them at least twice a day. And when necessary, we put out alerts to, to the public. Uh, during storm season, we talk to them a little more often, and we'll track those storms. We, we get information from the National Weather Service when those storms are off Africa's coast. And we track them hour by hour, day by day, to see where they're coming. So we're in constant contact with the National Weather Service. Very cool. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's all the questions we have. Appreciate it. We're done? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our hearing for today. Thank you.